thank you all for attending. Um, it was actually really lovely. So just before I get started, I want to get a quick overview of what levels are attending. So who is here from Med 4? So I know Craig is. Any other Med 4s? Okay. Um, who is here from Med 3? You too. Born in Moncton. Yeah. Born in Moncton. Awesome. And any Med 2s? Okay, so you're in Med 1s in St. John? Awesome. Good for you. I love it. Sweet. So, okay, that just kind of is going to give me a way to tailor this talk a little bit, so that'll be great. So, um, for those of you, I guess, who don't know me, so I'm Ricarda. I'm a fourth year at DMND uh, this year. I just returned from kind of a four-month um, whirlwind across the country to do various neurology electives at different centers and gathered a lot of information. So I figured um, I would do a little bit of a talk on kind of what I've learned throughout my electives. Um, I kind of structured this as a series. So it's gonna be a three-part series with kind of the following object uh, objectives. Basically, um, I, just, I was looking for a way to build my teaching skills given that hopefully in five months I'll have some kind of teaching obligations. So please, um, I'll give my email at the end if you have any feedback, especially if it's constructive, please let me know and I'd be happy to modify it for the next talk. So um, this is going to be the three talks that I'll be giving. So the next one is going to be on Vertigo and the Hints um, exam, and it's going to be next Tuesday at the same time. And the one after that will be when I return from my CARMS uh, interview tour in February. And uh, just uh, to kind of point out the obvious that I'm still a fourth year student, so I had all of my uh, content verified by Dr. Bauma, uh, just to make sure that I'm giving you all the most up-to-date content that I can. So um, basically we're going to dive right in. So since we have kind of varying levels here, um, there are definitely two, there are basically two different kinds of stroke and we're going to spend the bulk of time today is talking about ischemic stroke. So that's about 80 to 90 percent of stroke cases that you'll see. So the basis of ischemic stroke is that a clot has formed somewhere usually the heart or the neck has traveled up into the brain vessels and blocked off an artery somewhere. And then all the tissue distally to it is hypoxic and dying and is giving you the symptoms that you would see clinically. Um, that's gonna be the main focus today. There is a second type, namely a hemorrhagic stroke. So this is when instead of an artery blocking, it actually bursts and creates a hematoma in the brain that's pressing on brain tissue. Um, that's about 10, 20% of the strokes you'll see. The reason I'm not going too much into it today is because these tend to be managed by neurosurgery and ICU fairly quickly, whereas in ischemic stroke, especially in rural centers, um, emergency medicine people tend to be involved for a lot longer and tend to need a lot more knowledge. So that's kind of where I'm coming from for that. So the, what the talk's gonna focus on today is basically you can have three outcomes in the emergency department when you're faced with an ischemic stroke. So the first one is either you can give TPA, um, which for those who've never heard of that, is an intravenous medication that is a massive blood thinner. So basically the item is to dissolve the clot. Um, and I'm pretty sure that any emergency department in New Brunswick that has a CT also gives TPA. I know we give it here in uh, Upper River Valley. Um, so any site that you train at will have this. There's also the possibility of doing EVT or endovascular thrombectomy. So this is a procedure that's done by interventional radiology, and the only place in New Brunswick that does it is in St. John. So there they actually thread a catheter up into the brain and pull the clot out. Um, currently that's standard of care. Um, the other opportunity or possibility is that you do supportive care only. So you would admit your patient, you would consult uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language, and you'd start meds for preventing the next stroke. So this talk is gonna focus on how to navigate these three possibilities and under which circumstances it might be appropriate to combine them or do just one. Um, just before we get into the approach, I just wanted to quickly make sure that we talk about how to ensure that what you have in front of you is actually a stroke. So I didn't know this until probably like quite a ways into my third year, but strokes actually has quite a few things that Convincingly, convincingly mimic it. So um, let's take, for example, the scenario of someone with uh, acute onset left-sided arm and leg paralysis. So um, I know you're all muted, but if any of you are courageous, 
Uh, does anyone want to wager, I guess, what might mimic a scenario like that? So yeah, I mean, I didn't really know this either. I didn't even know that there were mimics in the first place, but usually the four major ones that we talk about are these ones. So hypoglycemia is kind of the one that you don't believe until you see it. I saw a case in Vancouver um, that was called as a stroke code. So exact scenario, complete left-sided arm and leg paralysis. Um, originally kind of called as a stroke code and then we checked his glucose and he was actually just hypoglycemic. So he completely resolved with just glucose. Um, the second one is just a fancy way of saying uh, kind of a unilateral paralysis post seizure. So that's why it's always important to ask about seizure at onset, since a little bit of unilateral weakness is actually pretty common after seizure. Um, the third one, we used to know this as conversion disorder, but basically this is a psychiatric stroke. So um, stroke-like symptoms in the absence of any blockage or bleed. That one's kind of interesting once, um, for the med ones, when you start your uh, psych chapter, you'll hear about that. And the fourth is hemiplegic migraine. So there are cases of migraine, they're very rare, when uh, you can actually have hemiplegia either as a manifestation of the migraine or as a manifestation of the aura, which is kind of cool. Um, we also have to talk about the other side. So strokes can be very often mislabeled. So the most common one that we see is probably a Wernicke's aphasia. So just to recap, so uh, W stands for word salad, right? So when someone just strings a bunch of words together that doesn't, the, they don't make sense, that's a Wernicke's aphasia. And that can quickly be labeled as like an intoxicated patient. Um, similarly, there's thalamic and small vessel strokes. It's really not important to know where these areas are. Just be aware that there are strokes that can have very drastic fluctuations in level of consciousness. Um, and these can also be labeled as intoxications. And then of course there's um, non-dominant temporal strokes uh, that present as agitated blue delirium. So basically anyone who comes into the ER with any sort of altered mental status or altered level of consciousness would probably warrant a CT for these reasons. So this is the scale. I know it's very hard to read and it's fine if you can't read it. Um, that we use to assess someone acutely. Uh, it's meant to be a very rapid bedside assessment, one or two minutes max, uh, that will give you the severity of a stroke. Um, this is on MD Calc. So for those of you who have the app, which is hopefully everybody, um, just Google or type in NIH and it'll pop up. So instead of kind of going through it line by line and just kind of boring you, I was wondering if someone could be voluntold here in Waterville to be a just someone I could try in an age on. <laughs> like, I have friends, it's just easier to demonstrate and talk through it. Let's do, do it. Mean? Yeah? Awesome. All right, I'm gonna do an NH oh. on Natalie. I'm the superior here, so. Superior. <laughs> we'll let you give you a break. Yeah. For the record, one, one Craig is pulling rank. It. It's the first time I've got to do that. <laughs> All right, so um, this is how you go about doing an NH. So as in any scenario, you would first start by introducing yourself. So hi, I'm Ricarda, I'm part of the stroke team. Gonna do a few silly things to you today, okay? So first of all, um, what is your age? I'm 27. Okay, and what month is it? January. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about that. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Can you close your eyes? Good. Now open your eyes. Can you make a fist? Good. So these uh, initial questions are just general level of consciousness questions, um, seeing how well they respond to one step commands, etc. So the next step, can I get you to look at my finger? Without moving your head, just follow my finger with your eyes. So here you would do just horizontal gaze. So normally when you get taught in a neurological exam, you'd also kind of do the vertical part. The NIH is meant just for horizontal gaze. And what you're trying to assess here is you wanna make sure that the eyes cross midline on both sides. So if suddenly you're here and eyes don't cross midline, no matter how much you like wave around, that means that they might have a gaze palsy. So that might be, um, that's definitely a stroke finding. Um, next is visual. Can you cover your left eye for me? Perfect. You were slightly off center. Can I get you to look at my nose? Perfect. And now without looking away from my nose, how many fingers total? Three. Good. How many fingers total? Good. So you do that on both eyes. Um, we, reason I like to do both quadrants simultaneously is just because it's quicker, but also it checks for um, a uh, inattention. So with two simultaneous stimuli, are you perceiving both or just one side? 
Um, next is facial palsy. So can you raise your eyebrows? Good. Can you smile, show me your teeth? Great. So just rapid assessment for facial droop. Next, can you raise your left arm for me like this and keep it there for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So you do that in all limbs. The rule of NIH is in the upper limb, you do 10 seconds each. In the lower limb, you do 5 seconds each. Um, next is ataxia. Can you touch your nose? Perfect. With the same finger, reach out and touch my finger. Go back and forth. So this is a dysmetria screen. So you really want to make sure that you're stretching to the full length of your elbow. If there's any kind of crease in the elbow, you're not going far enough. So what you're looking for um, as a positive finding would be dysmetria. So that means um, missing the target, either the finger. Also look out for this. So people with dysmetria are actually more commonly miss their own face and like poke themselves in the eye. And we get so focused on the finger that we don't notice it. So this is dysmetria. <laughs> Um, quick sensory screen. This is a very gross sensory screen. Nothing like your sensory exam. Uh, close your eyes for me. Which side am I touching? Right. And now? Left. And now? Both. Good. So you do that on arms and legs. The point is to do gross sensory screen on both sides, but you also want to do simultaneous stimuli. Once again, to see if they're neglecting one side and only perceiving one stimulus. Um, last part is a language exam. So um, can you repeat a few words for me? Mama. Mama. 50, 50. 50, 50. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you did it twice. I know, I, I did. did it twice. <laughs> no, no, 50, 50. Um, Huckleberry. Huckleberry. Baseball player. Baseball player. Good. So this is kind of a set of four words on the NIH that are meant to be very consonant heavy. So they're meant to allow you to identify a subtle dysarthria. So a bit of slurring of speech, not enunciating your consonants. And the last part. Um, I'm going to get you to name a few objects. What is this? Your thumb. Good. What is this? A knuckle. And this? Name tag. Good. And what is this? Phone. Good. So um, you want to name uh, common and uncommon objects. So for common objects, I go with thumb and phone. For uncommon, I go with knuckle and name tag. Um, so that's basically an NIH. Um, at bedside, usually this doesn't take longer than one or two minutes. Um, and very easily scorable. It's all laid out there for you on MD Calc. Um, and it basically allows you to assess stroke severity very quickly. Whenever you study an assessment tool, it's important to know what its pitfalls are. So NIH is very good for identifying anterior circulation strokes, but it misses strokes of the posterior circulation. I'm not gonna bore you with what arteries those are, but just be aware that posterior circulation strokes affect the brainstem, cerebellum, and occipital lobes. So these don't usually present as your stereotypical stroke. They don't present with the, you know, arm, leg, weakness, facial droop. They present with intractable vertigo or intractable vomiting or suspicious HINTS exam, etc. And if you've never heard of a HINTS exam, that's great. And you should come to my next talk because I'll be talking about how to do one and how to differentiate kind of benign from um, non-benign vertigo. Um, the other pitfall is just that it doesn't account for stroke mimics. Um, so we often do thrombolyzed mimics, actually, like migraines and conversion disorders, uh, which is fine. So uh, the stroke system is meant to be quite sensitive, so inevitably you're going to end up with false positives. Um, and thrombolyzing someone without an acute stroke actually doesn't raise their risk of bleeding all that much. So this is fine to do. Um, so the takeaway from this, just because someone scores low on the NIH does not mean that they may not have a posterior circulation stroke. So just be aware of that. So I'm going to go into a very stepwise approach on what to do if someone comes into the emergency department um, and they're labeled as possible acute stroke. So as with any acute and stressful scenario, which these often are, um, remember that the first step is always to take your own pulse first. Just kind of center yourself. Know that you have lots of help available around you and that uh, you can always ask for help if you need it and you can just go in and do your thing. Second step is ABCs, as we've been told. So as you walk into the room, quickly look at your patient. Are they protecting their airway? Is their level of consciousness kind of shaky? Those are important things to take note. Next, look at the monitor and screen their vitals for any possible contraindications to a clot buster. So the main one would be a blood pressure of uh, above 180 over 105. If they have a blood pressure above that, 
at this point, it's probably a good idea to immediately ask for a labetalol bolus because you're going to get to need that or need to get that pressure down if you're going to want to thrombolyze them. And at this point, you haven't excluded that fully yet. Um, usually at this time, some uh, ED nurse has done a finger stick glucose at the bedside. So just make sure that it's not too low since we talk about uh, that mimicking stroke quite often. And it also shouldn't be too high. So there's some studies that say that TPA in people who are hyperglycemic actually leads to poorer outcomes. Lastly, you want to look at the INR. So either you order STAT labs for coagulation studies or some centers offer point of care INR where you can actually do it at the bedside. I wouldn't waste too much time on this unless you have a reason to believe that your patient's INR is out of whack. So if they're on warfarin or if they're known for some type of liver disease, then I would definitely wait for the INR to come back. Otherwise, just plow through your algorithm. So the next step, you've done your, um, you've kind of centered yourself, you've done your ADCs, now you need to do a very, very, very quick history. So the extent of a stroke history is really determining the time of onset, and you need it as, it as exactly as possible because there's a time limit associated with TPA. And as most of you know, that's three to four and a half hours. Ideally, we'd like to give it less than three hours. You have some, sometimes you have kind of unique scenarios like a wake up stroke. So often you'll see someone come in at like 8 a.m. and they say, at 6.30 I woke up and my right side was weak and I couldn't get out of bed. So in this scenario, 6.30 is not your time of onset because there's a chance that the stroke happened at some point earlier during the night and they just didn't notice. So you need to go by the time last seen normal. And unfortunately with sleep, that sometimes can mean that that's like 9 p.m. the night before. So often wake up strokes are past the window. Sometimes you get lucky and I've gotten lucky once where if you ask, okay, did, at any point of the night, did you get up to use the washroom or did you wake up and you were normal? And sometimes they'll say, actually, yeah, at 530, I used the washroom and I was totally fine. So then that becomes your time last seen normal. Rule of thumb, if you're all unsure, go by time last seen normal. Don't take risks with this, basically. Step four is your physical. So your entire neurological exam in the setting of stroke uh, becomes the NIHS. So two minutes max, basically just determine if it's minor, major, or severe. I wouldn't get too caught up in the numbers. Um, just basically know if it's in the single digits, it's mildish. If it's in the teens, it's bad. If it's in the 20s, it's really bad. So next step would be to do your imaging. So um, do any of you know in the, in the setting of kind of, a, let's say, a rural emergency department or semi-rural, what are the two imaging investigations that you need immediately in a stroke patient? Any of you done this before? Yeah, so one is a plain non-contrast CT, the other is um, CT angiogram. So we call that like CTA or CT CTA combo. So this is because they answer very specific sets of questions. The non-contrast CT will tell you if there's blood. So this is the first step in your assessment where you will actually know whether your patient is having an ischemic stroke, so blockage, or a hemorrhagic stroke, so an intracranial bleed. Um, Nothing else really reliably tells you that. So this is the most important part. The second question that the non-contrast answers is if there are any signs of established infarct. So when you're having a stroke, you it actually takes a, about 10 or 12 hours for the tissue to die. And until that time, it does not show up on CT. So if someone uh, that you're evaluating told you they had a stroke two hours ago and you're seeing CT changes, that means that stroke is likely older than they think and you cannot TPA it. But if you have no signs of bleed and no signs of established infarct, then you should immediately proceed to evaluating for TPA and you need to use the 2018 guidelines. So if you take anything away from this talk, please take this away. The guidelines on absolute and relative contraindications for TPA were updated in 2018 and many emergency departments have not adapted this yet. So the pre-printed order sheets that you will see for contraindications may actually be outdated. So just be aware, and we're, I'm going to flash them up there just so you have them um, in a couple of slides that they've recently changed and people may sometimes be working with outdated information. I'll address a couple points. So these are two reasons that I've heard very often for not thrombolizing someone, so not giving someone TPA. One is that their stroke is deemed minor. 
So if someone has an NIH of like five or six and people are like, eh, I don't really want to give them TPA. So labeling someone a minor stroke, first of all, is very subjective. And what might be considered minor to you may not at all be minor for your patient and their occupation. And also, I just want to stress that the neuro exam does not assess function. So it's meant to be a diagnostic tool only, and it will actually give you no indication of how that patient is going to function when they get home. So just be very careful with excluding strokes that you think are minor for those reasons. Also be ex uh, careful with excluding strokes that are improving in front of you, just because like we discussed, there's some strokes that can have wild fluctuations and you may just be catching someone on a downslope, whereas in the next hour, they may actually gain six or eight points on the NIH. Um, so that's basically that for non-contrast. For the CT angio, that basically just answers one question, which is, is there a visible proximal clot? And if yes, then your patient is a candidate for EVT. And regardless of whether you gave TPE, uh, TPA or not, you should send them to St. John to at least be evaluated for EVT. These are, this is the bare bones of what you need. Some centers have more fancy stuff available, but you're just trying to answer two questions, right? For non-contrast, is my can patient a candidate for TPA? And CT angio, are they a candidate for EVT? Your step six, you can probably, probably already know where it is, but you need to call a neurologist at some point. The reason why I have an asterisk there is that um, a, a, I'm gonna have a couple, in a couple slides, I'm gonna talk about how to actually do that. So I'll walk you through how to call neurology, because I realize it can sometimes be kind of scary to call a consultant, especially when you're junior. Um, but also, uh, you can actually be doing this while the imaging is pending. So a lot of our neurologists frequently get, get calls while the CT is still pending, just to eliminate any time delay. Um, so just before I walk you through that, I just want to show you a couple of CTs. Um, and because I talked kind of under the non-contrast, what are signs of established infarct? So this is what you're looking for. On the left there, you can see um, the area that the red arrow is pointing to. There's kind of a darker area. So that is kind of a nice, very typical wedge-shaped hypodensity from an MCA stroke. So that tissue is dead tissue. If you see that on CT, you should probably not TPA your patient because basically their stroke is complete and all the at-risk tissue is already dead. Um, in the second picture, uh, you have effacement of sulci, we call it. The best way to evaluate this, there's kind of arrows pointing to it, but um, I would actually go to the 12 o'clock position of that brain in the cortex and slowly work my way along the cortex in a clockwise manner. So you can see as you kind of work your way like one, two, three, four, all the sulci are nicely visible. They nicely project from the cortex to subcortex and you can see them very easily. Once you get to eight o'clock, things kind of become swimmy, right? It looks like you're looking at that wedge of tissue through water and that's exactly what's happening. Um, that tissue is edematous and that is also an indication that most of the stroke is already completed. So if you see any of these findings, do not TPA your patient. If uh, there's also the possibility of a bleed, so like I kind of mentioned earlier, there's no reliable clinical indicator that what you have in front of you is a bleed. There are some hints that should um, raise your index of suspicion at least, and that would be the ones listed. So headache, vomiting, decreased level of consciousness, and very high BP, but all of them can fool you. But if you have more than two uh, present, you should definitely be thinking about a bleed. The only way to tell for sure though is a CT. So the way that shows up is like this. It's very hard to miss. So uh, remember B goes for B, blood is bright. So blood will show as bright. Um, hypoxia will show and water will show as black. So you can actually see uh, kind of a dark area of um, edema around that bleed already. So same thing here don't give them TPA because all you're going to do is worsen that bleed and probably kill them. These are the contraindications that I was talking about. So as you can see at the top, these are the gold standard 2018 updated exclusion criteria. And the only absolute exclusion criteria that you should still be using are any hemorrhage on brain imaging or any active source of hemorrhage elsewhere in the body. So for example, um, an active GI bleed that could act as a source of massive hemorrhage. Everything else is relative. 
Um, so for the historical ones that are listed there, obviously you'd either go to the chart or get collateral or ask the patient. Um, for the clinical ones, I figured I'd just briefly recap um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, usually your CT catches this, not always, but some clinical indications would just be headache and meningismus, so uh, neck stiffness or pain upon neck movement, um, maybe hinting towards a subarachnoid. Uh, point three there, if you have the hypertension, we talked about this earlier, be really aggressive in lowering that blood pressure, also because uh, blood pr high blood pressure on its own can cause a bleed. <coughs> So your first line treatment there would be labetalol boluses. If you have any concerns that your patient's heart rate is kind of already borderline and um, you don't want to drop it further, then choose a heart rate neutral agent like hydralazine or a fast onset ACE like uh, enalaprilat. And of course the laboratory ones you get from stat labs or point of care readings. So that's what you can use. Uh, that's the, most, I think the gold standard uh, you should be having with you. So now I'm going to tell, show you how to call neurology. So um, very scary when you're junior. And I found that often when I was calling consultants of any specialty, I didn't really know what they would want to know. So here's an example of a brief kind of patient synopsis that shows you what a neurologist would want to know in this scenario. So um, they definitely want to know your name. Uh, you should tell them your position, where you're working. Uh, that you're suspecting acute stroke that is TPA eligible, and then you need to back up your claim. Why are they eligible for TPA? You have a clear time of onset. She has a pretty decent NIH score. You can list her symptoms there if you want. She has no current source of bleeding. That shows that you've done some legwork in uh, trying to find exclusion criteria. Does not take anticoagulants. Glucose is normal. BP is good. And CT is being done as we speak. Always really nice if you could tag on at the end, would you like me to go set up for telestroke? Um, not sure how, may, how much you guys know about the telestroke system in New Brunswick, but because New Brunswick is basically kind of a have-not province and a lot of our centers don't have neurologists on site, um, we now do rotating provincial calls. So one neurologist will be on call uh, for strokes for the entire province. And if they're not in-house, which will usually be the case, uh, they will set up a telestroke consultation. So there's dedicated rooms in each hospital's ED, at least each hospital that has a CT, uh, with video conferencing equipment, and they can assess them from a distance with a trained helper at the site. It's actually very elegant because they can um, forward all their orders and consult summaries directly to your hospital, so you don't have to waste time faxing stuff back and forth. So it's all very efficient and very seamless, usually. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note on facial droop because I've been throwing that term around a little bit and actually this is not as straightforward as you would think and people actually often label the wrong side as the droopy side and by people I most definitely my, mean myself I've done this more than once so um, the reason for this is there's actually a lot of variation in people's normal and some people have the appearance of a droop just on an everyday basis so the one neurology approved way of not missing subtle facial droops is to go by the nasolabial fold. So what I mean by that is right there. So I pulled this image off of Google, so I really apologize because for some reason they circled the healthy side. <laughs> but so actually this woman has a right-sided facial droop. If you compare the two nasolabial folds, you can actually see that the right one is flattened and not as deep. So this woman has a very subtle right-sided droop. Whereas by the, if you go by the corner of the mouth technique, you may actually start to like, kind of suspect the left side because it's kind of curving at the end. So yeah, after I used this, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I got it wrong a lot of times, but as soon as I started going with nasal labial fold, I never missed a facial droop again. Very effective technique. So let's, uh, kick up the drama a little bit. So suddenly your neurologist's laptop is starting to go staticky and through the static, she screams at you to uh, assess your patient for give, basically have an informed consent conversation about TPA. So you being a good med student run to your attending, but they're busy with the trauma code and they need you to handle this. So what do you do if you are ever in the unfortunate situation where you need to have an informed consent discussion with your patient? A couple things you need to think about when it comes to TPA, um, which is the biases and the evidence. So 
very kind of open, or well, openly talking about this, but various people carry biases about TPA especially and treating acute strokes. And a lot of these biases make a lot of sense when you understand where they're coming from. So for example, emergency medicine often tends to be a little gun shy and they can be biased towards not treating because they are the ones who have to tend to the brain bleeds when they come in. And they often are the ones who have to comfort the sobbing families and it's all very sad. So they, it would make sense that they would have gotten somewhat of a healthy respect for brain bleeds and anything that can cause brain bleeds. Neurology, on the other hand, is often called a little trigger happy because we aggressively treat anyone we can just because we see the extent of disability and ruptured family dynamics and lost quality of life and follow up. So we like to TPA anyone we can. Uh, the point is not that any particular group is right. Um, different people just have different experiences. The only thing that really matters in a scenario like this is what does your patient want? And your job is to just give them the numbers so that they can make a decision in a way that works for them. So what is the evidence then? So according to the most rigorous and most statistically powered clinical trials that we have, patients who are treated with TPA are at least 30% more likely to have no disability at three months post-stroke. So there's a reason I highlighted that part in red, because as of right now, we have absolutely no evidence whatsoever that people treated with TPA do better at 24 hours or at 48 hours or at two weeks after they're treated. But we have really good evidence that at three months, people who were treated with TPA do much better. So it takes a long time for the effects of TPA to manifest themselves, but if you give them time, they're there. That being said, there's a lot of risks associated with that. The major one is brain bleeds. So they tend to occur in about five to 6% of patients who, give, who are given TPA, but there is a baseline rate anyway um, of patients who don't get TPA, about 0.6 to 1%. Uh, you can also breathe extracranially, so usually GI, that's about 2%, and you have about that same percentage of risk for an anaphylactic reaction. Overall, the number needed to treat for TPA within three hours is eight. So that number needed to treat is probably unheard of for most medications. Um, mo most medications that we regularly prescribe, so antihypertensive statins, have numbers needed to treat in the range of like 30 or 40. And like listed there, PCI post STEMI is actually 29, and we very routinely rush PA patients to the NGO suite. Um, so just be aware that it does drop pretty significantly if you wait that extra 1.5 hours. So within three hours is the best thing you can do. So how does this actually translate to when you're trying to have a conversation with a patient who might not like percentages and just generally might not be very literate? So I always like to have one statement, what is happening to you and what is this? So you're having a stroke, we have a medication for this, it's called TPA. It's a massive clot buster and it can improve your stroke symptoms, but there's a risk it can give you a deadly bleed. Then you would move on to benefits and it's best to give these in absolute and not relative numbers because relative numbers can sometimes be misleading and often kind of hard to understand. So I'd like to use the out of 100 people approach and I you round both numbers up to make them a little prettier. So I would say if 100 people are treated with TPA, 55 will have no disability after three months. If you take the same 100 people and don't, th don't treat them, then 40 of them will have no disability. So that means for every 100 people you treat, 15 more will benefit from no disability. Um, you also need to approach the risks in that same way. So I try to say out of 100 people who take it, five will have a major brain bleed, which often uh, will be lethal. Two will have bleed elsewhere, but we can usually treat it. But that also means that 93 will have no bleeding at all. And in many cases, you can kind of start seeing people's eyes glaze over and they don't really understand you. For those people who don't like numbers, you need to modify your approach and just boil it down to what matters. So the approach that I like is asking, how devastating is your current disability to you? And if there was no guarantee that you would ever improve without treatment, would the small risk of a deadly brain bleed be worth that to you? Or would I worth trying the treatment? And this can be very subjective 
some people will immediately go, oh no, absolutely not. I would never want to risk a brain bleed, and that's that. Other people um, could even consider a very minor deficit to be completely devastating. If your patient's still having time, putting the, uh, kind of a hard time putting this into context, an approach that you can take is asking, do you drive and what's your occupation? Sometimes that helps them put, kind of put it into their own context a little better. As in, you know, if I could never drive again, then yeah, the risk would be worth it to me. So let's just assume your patient consents. So at that point, things start happening very quickly. Usually at this point in a stroke center, like an ED nurse would have already pre-mixed the TPA. Um, this is the dosing, like don't worry too much about it. Just be aware that there's a max dose and that you give the first 10% as a bolus and hang the remaining 90% as an infusion over 60 minutes. Um, the more important bit is what you do to monitor your patient while the infusion is running. So you wanna keep an eye on their blood pressure, keep them at the same target as you did initially, monitor for any signs of brain bleed. So that would be headache, acute hypertension, acute vomiting. Any of those three signs would be immediate signals that you have to rescan your patient for a bleed. And if they do get angioedema, um, which the risk is actually much higher if they're on an ACE inhibitor, interestingly, so just be wary if you get a stroke patient on an ACE inhibitor. Um, if they do get it, you would start a very um, standardized protocol of discontinuing the infusion and then basically bombarding them with antihistamines and steroids, and if that doesn't work, you'd page anesthesia for a stat intubation. Um, just from a practical note, there are some problems with consent that pop up sometimes. So obviously, if your patient can give consent, you need their consent. You need to have that conversation with them fairly quickly. There are many scenarios in an acute stroke case where you can actually not get consent. So one is if they're just so incapacitated. So one example is if, if they're phasic. So if we go back to our Wernicke's aphasia, if they are presenting to you with this word salad and they very obviously don't understand what they're saying, that is an indicator they also don't understand what you're saying. So you cannot have consent conversations in someone who is profoundly uh, receptively aphasic. There's also something about right MCA strokes that's very interesting. So right MCA would present with left facial droop, left arm weakness, left leg weakness. But interestingly, apathy is also a feature of a right MCA stroke. So these are very interesting because you'll meet these patients, they're slouched over to the right, completely ignoring the left half of their world. And you kind of talk to them and you'll be like, hey, how are you doing? They'll be like, oh, I'm doing great. And you'll be like, yeah, you're sort of having a stroke. And they'll be like, oh, okay. Like they just couldn't give a crap about anything that's happening around them. And or obviously that's just a manifestation of that very particular stroke that they're completely apathetic and couldn't care less. So you also cannot have a con consent conversation. So what do you do there? The guidelines and standard of care is that consent for TPA may be presumed in incapacitated patients. Uh, that's coming from a massive survey that was published in JAMA where people actually were asked on what they would want in that scenario. Also, a really interesting systematic review came out this year uh, that analyzed stroke-related malpractice lawsuits in emergency departments. And they found that in the context of stroke, the most common reason to sue your ED attending was not treating with TPA. There was only one case um, that was filed because of complications of TPA, and that was actually dismissed because TPA was considered standard of care. Um, so that. ED physician never um, was found guilty of malpractice. So the takeaway from that is most patients tend to want to take the risk. So that's why we can presume consent if they're incapacitated. There's also times associated with a lot of these. Um, so there's door to CT guidelines, there's door to needle uh, guidelines. These are gonna be pretty difficult to obtain in semi-rural sites where you don't have dedicated stroke teams and that's just kind of a, re a reality but just be aware of how pressing some of these um, approaches are and how tightly you should they're regulated just because for the reason that you all know time is brain and for every minute that you delay treatment in someone with ischemic stroke they lose two million more neurons so that 
actually translates to about 12 kilometers of myelinated fibers every minute. So that's why time is brain is, is such a, I don't know, dogma in neurology. And that's why you can see a lot of neurologists getting very impatient in the emergency department. I'm just gonna give you a couple of slides about EDT uh, because it is getting standard uh, to be standard of care. So like we said, um, this is where you actually puncture the femoral artery. You thread a catheter up to the brain and manually pull the clot out. The window for this is increasing as we get new evidence. So recently, thanks to the Dawn and Diffuse 3 trials, we can actually do it up to 24 hours. And that means that usually this is the only possibility for people who have wake-up strokes. Right now, EDT is the most the superior treatment for acute strokes with a, an NNT of three or four if you select your candidates properly. So that means you need to treat three or four people for one person to benefit. These are probably the most miraculous recoveries that you'll see if you ever get the chance to be a uh, part of one. Um, I remember a case in Ottawa, we had a 30 year old who came in with complete left-sided hemiplegia, was likely gonna be wheelchair bound for life. We got her on the table within two hours, um, pulled the clot out and one minute post-procedure, she was raising her arm again. So if you ever want to produce these kinds of recoveries in people, within minutes, then interventional neuroradiology should be on your radar. A um, couple of inclusion criteria. So your patient should be functional and independent at baseline, and there must be a visible clot on CTA, and this clot should also be pr relatively proximal, so you can physically get to it and pull it out. And the earlier you can do it, the better. Five or six hours should be your ideal target. You can also combine EVT with CPA. A lot of people actually don't know this, but EVT actually has a much lower complication rate if you already have TPA on board, mainly because it tends to prevent periprocedural embolization. And if possible, you should treat with both. So what uh, peripheral sites in Brunswick do commonly is uh, they use the drip and ship method where they give the TPA bolus in the emergency department, then hang the remainder of the infusion, and while that's running, they ship them off to St. John to get EDT. Um, if you ever wonder what that looks like, so um, on the top right, you can see an angio suite, which is where they would do their work. In the top left, uh, sorry, the bottom left, A and B show you the before and after of an MCA recanalization, so the middle cerebral artery. And you can just see how much vascular territory and how much tissue you're salvaging. Like that's probably more than a sixth of your brain. So that is why you see the effects that you see. And of course, on the bottom right, you just have the pictures of what the clots actually look like once you pull them out. So they're, they can be massive. So what do I want you to take away from today? I want you to know that TPA has great evidence at three months. But as you know, not at 24 hours, 48 hours, two weeks, etc. So give it time, and usually its effects manifest themselves. Um, if you give it within three hours, the benefits will be greatest for your patient. They're still substa substantial within 4.5, but the risk of bleeding does go up um, if you wait that long. Um, the most effective treatment we have is EDT. If you uh, select your candidates properly, the NNT is pretty impressive. And whether you use either is going to be guided either by non-contrast CT or CT and CT NGO. So you need both to make a decision. And one rule of thumb that I always like to put in there is that the best way that you're going to learn when you're in third year is by actively finding ways to throw yourself into the fire. So it would be if you're at all interested in neurology or emergency medicine. Um, it would be a good idea to maybe even practice in an IHS in two minutes until you get it down pat at home. And then during your next shift, just ask your attending to supervise you um, if you could do an NIHS during the next stroke. I found that once I started um, doing things like that and be more, being more, more active participant, I learned a lot more, a lot faster. If you want to know anything more, this is where I got a lot of the content from. Just Google Canadian Stroke Recommendations. Um, and everything's there for you. They also have guidelines for stroke management in pregnancy, if that's something you're interested in. So they were also recently updated. So this was a long talk today. So I think I went just slightly over. 
Um, but I would just like to, um, if you have it all interest, I made a one pager. So in one page, I summarize the most important parts of this stroke, uh, stroke talk. Um, and on the back, I also included the synopsis, like a patient case example with blanks that you can fill in if you're ever really stressed and just want to read off something when you're calling neurology. Um, and there's also, they're, they're cut off there, but all the statistics for uniform consent conversation are there too. So um, just a quick plug for the upcoming talks. So the next one is next Tuesday, same time. Um, and my email is there. Please reach out to me basically about anything that you want, especially if you're interested in neurology. Um, but if you have any feedback to what I can do to make these talks better for you, to help you learn better, please let me know. Um, and I'll try to do that in time for the next talk. So uh, I'll open it up for questions. Um, feel free to leave if you have somewhere to be, but we do have the room in, um, we have, do have the room till seven. Hi, Rika. Hey. I should have. Um, <laughs> we're wondering how we can get that summary sheet and your slides, um, if that's okay. Just email me. Okay. So email Perfect. me and I'll re reply to it. Um, I have no idea how to keep track of people who are going to be attending, otherwise I would have just sent it out to everyone, but just email me and I'll happily send it back to you. Okay, sounds good. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay. Are you using that in NHS all across Canada? You're using it in academic settings? I've never heard of it before. Um, so peripheral sites don't tend to use it. Like basically any program that doesn't have a dedicated stroke uh, like, team doesn't tend to that. use it much. Is it, is it the stroke team that does it or is it the eMERGE docs that do it first? In academic centers, the yeah, exactly. uh, stroke team does it. Okay, that's what I was wondering. But it, um, it is the best way to assess. It's, the NIHS is just kind of a way for neurologists to speak a common language, so yeah. or for special or doctors to speak a common language, yeah. so that if one calls the other, they can be like, this is a really severe stroke, we have an NIH of 20. Then that's everyone good. knows, okay, this is bad. Um, yeah. That's fair. But I actually haven't seen that before. Yeah. And then the new guidelines there too, like they're like I was surprised that like relative like major surgery, like relative does that just mean like if this person's crashing, just give them TPA. Is that essentially what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean a you know ischemic I mean? stroke is probably never really gonna crash on you unless they really infarct a weird area, which is pretty rare. So like if they've had a recent surgery though. I'd be very hesitant. It depends yeah, I you know I, mean? I agree. It depends on how recent. Because like I saw like I was like that and I was like they're not any coagulation or yeah. there weren't like absolute contraindications to those new guidelines. So anticoagulation is partially because you can reverse a lot of anticoagulants okay. now. So it used to be that if anyone was on anticoagulation, people just wouldn't even call neurology. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, with endoxaban, you can reverse it. Um, like a lot of the DOACs can be reversed. Warfarin can be reversed. Yeah, okay. Um, so they just want... So they'll reverse it and then just give TPA. Yeah, so that's that, that makes seen, the fucking, yeah. that one's...